Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this ICAW webinar, what to look out for in tax technology in 2021 in association with tax systems. My name is David Lyford-Smith. I'm a technical manager in the tech faculty here at ICAW. It's my pleasure to be the, your facilitator for today's session. Uh, many of you might have seen the first webinar that we've done uh, a few weeks ago with tax systems around playing around in this space, and I'm very pleased to say that we have uh, been able to Secure Russell back again for uh, another webinar this afternoon, and we're going to hear a little bit about uh, some of the upcoming developments in tax technology for next year and looking beyond that as well. I uh, just want to briefly, before we get onto the presentation, talk about how you can interact with the webinar today. Uh, so the webinar platform that you're using has several different widgets, which you can resize and move around as you see fit for your viewing experience. And there are a couple ones I want to draw your attention to in particular. Uh, there is a Q&A widget uh, the, with the question mark logo that you can use at any point during the webinar to submit questions. Uh, so if you have any tech technical issues or any kind of issues with uh, accessing um, the webinar or similar, you can use it th to send those in. And of course, we are going to have a dedicated time for your questions at the end of the hour. So do think of uh, if you do think of any questions during the presentation, you can use that to send that in as well. Uh, please also note the resources widget, uh, which is on the right hand side with the uh, document pictured. You can use that to download a copy of the slides as well as find other useful links, downloads and information. So I mentioned it already, but for those of you who uh, didn't pick, uh, come along to our first webinar um, with tax systems, I just want to introduce briefly today's speaker, Russell Gammon. So Russell is the Chief Innovation Officer at Tax Systems. He is responsible for the innovation team within the business, tasked with moving all products to a single digital compliance platform with a cloud-first mentality. He's particularly interested in tax automation, calculation, and balancing best practice with a practical approach. Russell has significant tax expertise, having previously worked at Deloitte and KPMG for joining Tax Systems earlier this year. Delighted to welcome Russell back for his presentation today. And um, with that, I'll get out of the way and hand things over to you, Russell. Uh, thank you very much, David. Hopefully, um, everyone can hear me loud and clear. As, um, as David said, there's, um, there's a Q&A button down in there. Um, please do use it throughout. Um, feel free to ask any questions. We'll take as, as many as we can um, at the end of this. Um, usually, it's always a good way to kind of interact. So feel free to send anything uh, through there. So, um, yeah, the, 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 the topics of the day, there's quite a few things that I wanted to cover off. Um, and this has kind of come at quite a nice time because a few of you would have seen that there was a consultation released relatively recently um, from HMRC around corporation tax. So um, we can kind of add some things in that maybe had that not arrived, um, um, we wouldn't have been able to cover off. So just in terms of the agenda for the day, uh, kind of five key areas I wanted to have a look at. So kind of firstly setting the scene. Um, Kind of what have we seen this year? Uh, this is there is a bit of a recap in here from um, the, the one we did a few weeks ago that David was talking about, but it just kind of the key kind of themes that we've seen in 2020 to kind of uh, setting us up for kind of 2021. Um, then we'll spend a bit of time talking about the AT in 2021 and what I'm kind of calling the year of the digital link, and uh, that's kind of the main area of focus that we're seeing um, in the market right now, and a key thing that kind of HMRC are driving with their digital agenda in 2021 so we'll spend a bit of time talking about that then look at mtd for ct corporation tax um obviously the, the timetable for that is, is a is a long way off but actually looking at some of the um things that have been put out in the consultation talking you through a few um of those things in there just to kind of uh, hopefully make you aware um you know as a business we're um, very much involved in that process so we've um uh, been digesting that quite uh, substantially already, but uh, a lot of people uh, won't have done so far. So hopefully, you can glean some of the knowledge that we've got from from uh, diving through those 42 pages of consultation. Then talking practically a bit about technology, where do we kind of see the technology market at the moment? Um, what does that kind of best practice technology look like? What are the kind of key areas, main themes that we see? And then some kind of strategies about how we could put that technology in place. So what are we kind of seeing in the industry? What are we seeing our clients doing? Um, and what are kind of you know what are the tenders that are out there at the moment? What are people looking for from the technology? So, hopefully, um, a bit of a mix of theory and practice. Um, and as I say, if you've got any questions as we go, feel free to to reach out on the, the Q and A. Um, so, just setting the scene, kind of what have we seen from uh, from 2020? So, you know, tax and digitisation of tax is absolutely continuing. So, um, if we go back to to the summer, we saw um, HMRC put out a paper around their kind of 10-year plan around digitising their 
uh, that their kind of tax uh, function and the tax authority. Uh, and you could see that, you know, MTD has been in flight now, particularly with VAT for a few years, and people have kind of come to, to kind of get used to MTD. So everyone's now doing the submissions via the API, for example. So we've kind of got the first little bit from a UK point of view. But when you look outside of the UK, you actually see that there's, there's a lot going on. Um, and actually, a lot of authorities have gone quite a lot further um, I know, David, you, you and your team have been looking at some of these things, so I don't know if you wanted to, to comment just on, on a couple of these bits. Yeah, well, we've done a couple of versions of a paper called uh, Digitalization of Tax International Perspectives. It's actually linked, I think, in the resources section that's looking at a kind of comparison of all these different countries. Uh, we've done 12 countries case studies uh, in the most recent version, including Estonia, actually. They were one of the first ones that we looked at because of the sort of the, the kind of biggest success story, I suppose, for digitalization. Um, I think there's some really interesting stories out there in terms of different approaches, different types of priorities, um, but also some lessons to be learned in terms of the difficulty of kind of making a system that is uh, fair and works for everybody, including those who don't have access or uh, the kind of knowledge to, on how to use the internet um, on those who are uh, digitally excluded, as is the kind of term that we used. Uh, but then also about how change management works. And so, you know, some countries try to do all this digitalization thing in a real rush and do it all at once and tended to struggle, whereas others were kind of rolling out geographically or maybe doing it like the UK is doing it tax by tax. Um, all these sort of different uh, comparisons, but some really interesting lessons and lots of stuff to learn. We're looking at doing a third edition of that paper next year. Um, we've just started doing some early initial research uh, on the kind of impact that uh, COVID and uh, the kind of economic uh, changes that that has brought have uh, brought to the world of t digital tax. So looking forward to keeping keeping up with that as it goes forward. Yeah, and I, I, I think it's important because I think, you know, from, from a UK perspective, MTD has been um, quite quite an uptake. Quite a, people have been kind of, um, you know, had to had to change things and had to do things quite differently in, in an otherwise system that maybe hadn't changed that much for the for the few years prior. So MTD in the UK has been seen as a bit of a, a bit of a shift. But actually, if you then look outside the UK, um, other authorities have actually gone quite a lot further um, than the UK have gone. So it's a, it's an interesting uh, kind of mix, I guess. Um, the other kind of key trend that we saw in 2020, and these are some figures um, that I, I pulled from a, a report that McKinsey did, and we um, we went through them kind of one by one last time. But the report from McKinsey was effectively talking about how um, you know COVID has massively accelerated digitisation. So uh, the, the, the graph on the kind of top left there showing that you know a, a massive increase in digital interactions between clients, um, between customers and their clients. The one on the right, I think, is really important because that shows that. Um, you know, areas such as, um, you know, adoption to cloud. So I think about the sixth line or so there down is, you know, increasing migration of assets to the cloud. Prior to COVID, that was kind of on average taking 547 days um, to progress. Whereas, you know, with COVID, that's progressed to, you know, 23 days. So that's, you know, a 24-fold increase in how quickly people are moving assets to cloud. And, and we're certainly seeing that across the board. People have had to, they've been forced by COVID. Um, to adopt things much, much more quickly than they ordinarily would do, because otherwise they, they simply couldn't do business. And um, the, the graph there at the bottom left was really um, the, the, the kind of clincher, I think, from the McKinsey report is that in, in most people's views, in the um, you know CFO and senior leadership views, these kind of changes are here to stay. So while we're certainly not saying that um, you know people will never go back to the office and that we'll you know we'll, we'll be working remotely forever, that's obviously not the case. But um, certainly people people's perceptions is that these things are here to stick um, and, you know, remote working will form much more of a part of the uh, the kind of the everyday and therefore that has kind of ramifications onto, onto technology. So the quote at the bottom there was from Sat Nadella, who's the, the CEO of Microsoft, and I thought that was a really interesting quote that he gave on one of the, the Microsoft calls. The updates was around having seen two years of digital transformation in two months. And I think, you know, if you look at the stats around, for example, people using Microsoft Teams, I think pre-pandemic you were looking in the sort of around 10 million daily users. And I think the last stat I saw was 115 million daily active users and, and still exponentially growing. And, and Teams as a tool, um, you know, massively being adopted the same for Zoom and, and other similar um, products. So we've certainly seen um, a big rise in the use of technology throughout the workplace. And I think that therefore um, is the kind of backdrop to what we would expect to see going, going into kind of 2021 and into future years. 
Uh, and then if we look to kind of what HMRC are doing, um, and there's quite a few different things on this slide. Um, there are quite a few initiatives, MTD obviously being the main one from a technology viewpoint, but there are lots of other ones, BRR and BRR Plus. Um, the corporate criminal offence is something that we are seeing a little bit of a uptick in now, a few more cases, a few more, um, some of the high profile cases as well around that. So, you know, HMRC is starting to, to kind of, you know, continue to encourage businesses. And I think the general move music we get from them is that there is there is more of this, not less. It's, it's not going away. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's how we want to do business going forward. So while they absolutely can't rush into these things, and if you look at the timings around, for example, MTD for corporation tax, they're not rushing into anything. Um, but certainly they are kind of setting, they're still like saying, look, you, you know, we're, we're moving along a technology journey. And I think it's, um, it's important, therefore, for, for businesses to do that as well. So you'll see the impacts on customers, you know, increased scrutiny and, and, and fines. Um, and, and therefore, what we see around those customer needs. So these are kind of high level generic kind of themes. But we are seeing um, from clients that the, the requirement to reduce that kind of risk and to have that kind of contact list to review. And what we mean by that is that people um, generally are, are looking to technology um, to kind of, you know, not have to spend hours and hours and hours copy pasting things and doing things. Um, and, and the HMRC agenda is, is really kind of driving that. So. We are seeing kind of more wholesale, what I would call kind of digital transformation. I think, um, you know, I've worked in tax technology now, but uh, just coming up for 12 years. And I think um, certainly a lot of the projects and, and things I've been involved in can often be seen as kind of quite tactical kind of, you know, fix this particular problem, go here, or to make this small bit over here or whatever it might be. Um, and if you look to kind of the first phase of making tax digital where it was, you know, submit something via an API, um, it was a change, but it wasn't necessarily a, a fundamental, you know, wholesale change to the tax department or to the business. Well, I think what we're now seeing just, um, you know, a little bit more is that people are kind of looking to wholesale kind of digital transformation rather than just kind of kind of quick fixes. So that's kind of some of the backdrop from 2020. Um, I'll, I'll now move on to talk about 2021 and, and particularly focusing on VAT um, because it's the year of the digital link. And I think... Um, you know, just, just to kind of recap the kind of the, the mandate and where we've been, um, everyone's doing that kind of digital um, report submission by now, apart from some very, very small micro businesses, which are being called into scope um, from 2022. Um, and then from this year, you've got to kind of comply with the two other parts of the digital record keeping. So um, keeping the records digitally rather than on, on paper um, and also the digital link. So the digital links part. And I think um, the analogy I would use for kind of digital links um, as opposed to the API and the, even the, the record keeping is it's kind of that slight iceberg mentality in terms of, you know, doing things via the API and the record keeping. It's kind of, it's reasonably easy to understand. It's reasonably easy to implement something. Um, but the digital links is, it can be absolutely more of an unknown and it will depend on your business and your complexity and, um, you know, the systems that you've got in place. But certainly for some, we, we've seen digital links being a massive, massive project. We've seen people doing you know, months and months of work um, and, and, and having to really, really overhaul their system where they've got, a, you know, maybe a VAT reporting process that's 15 years old being run in Excel that uses a lot of manual intervention and those kind of things can't happen anymore. So uh, the phase two of, of, of MPD and the digital links really is um, what is driving a lot of activity in tax functions um, in the, certainly already. Um, I mean, over the last couple of months, we as a business have seen a lot of uptick in people wanting to talk about that technology um, to solve this. And I think we're seeing that going into the new year as well. So uh, just, to, just to cover off uh, what was kind of mandatory in terms of digital records, again, I think a lot of businesses have kind of got this covered um, or got this down reasonably well. So, um, you know, just this kind of the standing data that you need to have for digital records and um, the transactional data. And I think where, um, where people haven't had these, they've had to plug this gap quicker because it's, it has more kind of fundamental ramifications if you don't have this information. Um, I think, interestingly, it's something that is referenced quite a lot um, in the, the Making Tax Digital for Corporation Tax um, requirements. So, again, we are we're looking further down the road on those. But certainly um, uh, they talk about, HMRC talk about in the, in the consultation, they talk about gathering other pieces of information and, and having them held electronically, which I think for corporation tax isn't necessarily the case, whereas for VAT it's a transactional tax. They do tend to be the case. You know, you can't tend to calculate a VAT return without the transaction level detail is from a corporation tax return. You, you don't necessarily need to go down to that level of detail for everything. You certainly might do for some things, but but not for everything. So I think digital records is a key piece of VAT. It's not an area we get asked about a lot. I think a lot of clients have kind of got that one sorted. Um, but digital links, this is where it does get interesting. So this is kind of how HMRC define a digital link. So it's a data transfer exchange within 
uh, and between software programs, applications are products that make up a functional compatible software, and they must be digital and information continues to form part of digital records. And I think there are kind of a few grey areas around what does and doesn't constitute a digital link, and I'll cover that in my uh, in a couple of slides' time. Um, but I think that the, the way that I've been explaining it to people when they ask me is it's almost like that mentality you have back at school, and I think, um, you know, it's what you had to work, you know, show your workings when you did a a question in maths and it was for five marks and you've only got one mark for the answer, you've got four marks for showing you're working. I think it's a similar sort of mindset to say, you know, it's not good enough to just say, you know, you owe us a million or we owe you a million. It's a, it's it's that you have to be able to say why. Um, and I do think, you know, that you can kind of play around with the nuances of what might or might not be a digitally link, digital link. And I can, I, you know, I've heard lots of different arguments for or against um, some of these kind of specific areas. But I think um, it's, it's more of a mindset, and I think that's that's what's really key here. It's a mindset that digital linking is more of a, you know, it's not just good enough to kind of get the answer out the door anymore. We need to kind of understand why. And, and you know, that plays into other areas, you know, being able to audit something, being able to prove something. Um, so I do think that, uh, you know, it's the start of that kind of mindset. And I think a lot of tax functions have been thinking that way for a long time, but this is, you know, a continued push by HMRC to continue to kind of nudge you along that particular agenda. So um, quite an interesting one for me. Um, these are the timelines um, for those of you that are kind of um, still working on their, their digital links project. So um, but it comes in from the 1st of April, but it's the first full period following the 1st of April. So should you be kind of a calendar quarterly filer, you'll be, it'll be for your period 1st of April to 30th of June. So your submission um, at the start of August in 21. So that's the kind of first submission where you need to be kind of digitally linked. And onto what those links are specifically, um, the, the main thing that, that you can't do that we do tend to see in processes is that kind of copy paste or cut and paste. Um, so that's the one thing where, you know, we, we did tend to see a lot of people saying, OK, we would download uh, a report from our ERP system and then we would copy and paste that report into this tab in this spreadsheet. Or we would, you know, take that data and we would filter it to a certain tax code and then we copy and paste that data into a, to a spreadsheet. Um, and that kind of copy paste is not allowed. Now you can, you can solve that by linking in Excel. You don't have to use different software for that. But um, certainly, the kind of copy paste is the, is the main activity um, that we see that we, we're not allowed um, to do anymore. And I think uh, you know that that's the key one. I think therefore you can also we did see manual keying in of data. So we would see other instances where you might have you know a spreadsheet with kind of a summary tab, uh, and then you'd have some instructions that say you know run this report from SAP and then sum up this column and then type in the total of that column into this box. And again, it's the keying of the data that's not allowed. Now, you are allowed to make manual kind of adjustments for certain things like partial exemptions, but certainly you're not allowed to key data in um, in that sort of way. So I think those are the, the kind of key areas and, and that we see. Um, link sales, we do we do tend to see, and again, anyone that's um, worked in a, in a tax function for long enough will have seen all myriad of kind of Excel, so where you've got broken cells, broken formulas, macros that, um, you know, these things can all be compliant, but they are certainly high risk. Um, so whilst we, we, we are seeing some people kind of persisting with these methods, we are also seeing a lot of people saying, Do you know what, we're, we don't want to have risk in this part of the process, so we're going to remove uh, certain areas um, from that. So, you know, portable devices, again, in email, you, you know, these things can qualify as a digital link. So, it's, it, you know, the rules are reasonably lenient. But again, um, we've seen a lot of people trying to drive these out of their, their processes. But it's really that copy and paste is the key one for me. If you're copy and pasting in your current um, in your current VAT process, then it's something that you will not be able to do from that kind of April onwards, and that can, um, for certain processes, have quite a, a big ramification. Um, so, a couple of predictions from me then are kind of what we're what we're kind of seeing, and this is based on our kind of experience. So, I spend quite a lot of time talking to people about VAT processes and other tax processes, um, and this is kind of what we're seeing from our, our clients, what they're asking us. So. Um, what will it do? Well, it, it's absolutely driving data, data accuracy, and we're also seeing that. So where people are having to go back and prove their workings more, they're also spending more time looking at that kind of source data. And in a lot of instances, we might have seen people saying, well, we'll just kind of take that data as read, um, and they might do a check on it, but they might also, you know, they may not. Um, and this is kind of ask, because people are having to look at their processes again, they're asking, well, is this data quality good enough, or can I maybe go back to my finance team and request a different type of report, or I'll request a they do something a bit differently. So we are generally seeing a, a push around data accuracy. Um, and also, we know that uh, HMRC do these kind of checks, or do checks on data um, around, you know, quality of some of the data that they're looking at. Um, so, you know, looking for things like duplicate transactions, out period transactions. So 
we are seeing people asking for this a bit more, um, wanting to, you know, rather than have these checks that typically would have been done in Excel. You know, we, we, if you if you see a lot of in, uh, institutions that we work with, they will say, well, well, here's our kind of 50 page back reporting manual. And, you know, one of the one of the sections is around how do we do out of period transactions that tends to be, you know, we go to this Excel, we filter to any date outside of the transaction, outside of the quarter. Um, and we look at those manually. Um, we're seeing people wanting to build those in more automatically um, and, and into group transactions as well. So we are seeing people kind of questioning what they've done, um, which is great. It's, it's a good driver. It's, I guess, what HMRC were after to try and make sure that people weren't um, getting things wrong anymore. Um, uh, and, and, you know, that's what we're seeing a fair bit. So uh, the next kind of prediction is that we're seeing a lot of finance teams wanting kind of comfort. So, uh, it's more, it's, it's still kind of, you know, driving around the digital link point. It's all, everything in this kind of section is, is absolutely linked. So because it's an Excel process and because it largely has been an Excel process today, um, people are kind of saying, okay, well, if we're going to invest the time and the effort here and, and maybe some money into some form of solution, then um, we, we want to be able to kind of get comfort that things are right. So what's the kind of benefit we're going to get as a business? Um, and that's where people are therefore asking for other other things along the sides. So they're saying, well, you know, HMRC and submissions, you know, that's part and parcel of what we need to do as a function. But actually, can we use some of this data in other ways? So, you know, one of the requests we commonly see is can we you know, get a period on period comparison so we can kind of get comfort that, the, you know, we're going in the right direction. Again, these things have existed in Excel processes, but people haven't tended to use them that much. Or if they have, it's quite a manual process. It's quite a time consuming process and it hasn't necessarily been front and center. So we're seeing um, people saying, well, you know, what can we do with this data now that we're kind of putting it in a more robust uh, functional software? How can we kind of do something more? So that, that's something that we're seeing kind of requested more and more and more from our clients and from the industry. Um, and then another one is, you know, if you're going to spend your time looking at these um, processes, we are seeing people with having a desire to kind of automate a lot more of the process. So I think um, some of the stats, and we shared them in our, in our previous webinar, was that something like a quarter of organizations are spending more than 25 man days a year doing their VAT return process. There's a lot of time and effort that's put in and a lot of that is manual. So we reckon about 75% of a VAT reporting process is kind of manual processing, be it manual checks or manual data transposition or whatever that might be. There's just a lot of kind of heavy lifting that needs to be done. Um, and so when people are looking at this, they're saying, okay, well, um, again, if we're going to spend our time and effort and money um, looking at this process, then how can we get benefit from it? And, you know, part of that is cutting days out and cutting time out of that process. So we are seeing requirements. I mean, this, this example below is a, is a partial exempt and special method, which obviously is only relevant to a small number of institutions, but they, they can get incredibly complicated. And we are seeing more and more people looking to technology to automate these sort of things. And there's a number of ways you can do the automation, but I think um, we're seeing that a lot. Um, so those are a few of the trends that we're seeing um, from, you know, already now probably quarter four of 2020 has been a real big um, uptick in terms of interest in, in back technology. Um, and, you know, that will therefore move into uh, into 2021 and will probably be, you know, by my reckoning, probably the number one thing that people and tax functions will be spending their time on in, uh, in 2021. So what we're going to do, um, there's a couple of poll questions. We're going to ask you this one first um, on MTD for VAT to kind of see where we are. So. The first question is, um, how ready are you uh, for HMRC's digital link requirements? So the options range um, from the top, you know, totally ready. We're, we're already kind of up and running and we're, we're using, we're digitally linked and we're using software. Second one being we are ready and we're already doing that in Excel. Uh, the second one is that, you know, we're, we're a project's underway. We, we know what we're doing. We just haven't maybe finished doing it yet, but we're very happy with where we're going. Uh, the fourth one being kind of we're getting ready. Um, it's something that we want to do, um, but we don't really know what we're doing yet. Um, and, and the final option being is, is you know, it's something that uh, we know we need to do 21, 21, but really we haven't started yet. So if you could select your answers and uh, submit them, that'll be great. Just while everybody's doing that, just going to hop in quickly. So this is David here again. Just a reminder that uh, if you've already voted in the poll, then you can, of course, uh, use this time to think about questions. Uh, we are going to have dedicated question time at the uh, back end of the hour. So do make sure to be thinking about any questions you'd like to ask Russell about this and anything you'd like to bring up for discussion. You can send in your questions using the Q&A widget, which is available on the webinar platform. It's the question mark icon. Likewise, if you're having any kind of technical issues, you can use that as well. Although I should say in the first instance, if you have a loss of sound or any other kind of technical issue with the webinar platform, then refreshing almost always will fix that. So that's the first thing to try. Um, and I think that's uh, enough. We've had time to see the poll results come in. So I'll hand back to you, Russell. Cool. So let's 
So that's uh, that's that's an interesting spread of results, I think. I mean, it's quite a wide range. So um, we can see there just over just over half of you. So just 52 odd percent are totally ready for, for MTD for CT, which is great, given that you know in theory there's another four and a half months to go until the kind of starting bell. Um, either using dedicated software or using Excel. So there's a, there's a split there. Um, and then the rest is, is, you know, it's good to see maybe that only only one in eight to twelve percent are, are haven't, you know, kind of going, yeah, this is a 2021 problem. And you know, we do still see that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing to do. And we've seen, you know, other businesses, you know, a, a, for example, a business that deals heavily in in import export will have, you know, Brexit, for example, to deal with. So, and and that is a major thing. And obviously, there's there's a much tighter time horizon on that. So. Um, it's it's you know th those results are kind of in line with what I would expect. I think um, we are seeing people moving through the funnel, I guess, um, from the kind of bottom to the top, reasonably quickly um, over the course of the uh, the last couple of months. And I think we're we're going to see that because obviously, um, you know, best endeavours and everything. We still see we'll, we we will see a few people kind of leaving leaving it to the last minute. But it's good to see you know more than half people are ready already. Um, and then if you add on the 18% or sort of 70% of people have kind of confirmed the approach that they want to take. Um, so that's great. Cool. So moving on then, and this was um, a, as a timely one. So MTD for corporation tax. So, um, you know, as a business, tax systems have been doing um, corporation tax software for 27, 28 years. Um, it's the kind of bread and butter of what we do. Um, and therefore, this for us as a business has been, has been absolutely massive. And consultation has been something that We've known about for a while. We didn't know when it would arrive, and fortunately for us, it landed a couple of weeks ago. So, what I wanted to do with this section, um, obviously, it's still very early days, and MTD for Corporation Tax was to just give you a few kind of insights, um, snippets into MTD for Corporation Tax, and, and kind of what that might look like. Obviously, it is in consultation, so it is obviously subject to change. You know, HMRC can obviously change their tune. Um, for example, if you look at MTD for Corporation Tax back in, uh, uh, sorry, MTD for, for VAT. If you look at the original consultation document, they actually said that they wanted to remove Excel from the process entirely. Um, and by the time, obviously, that came to kind of legislation and, 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 and into practical use, um, Excel was kind of added back in as a, as, a, as a possible method. And therefore, you know, what we're saying here may well change over the next couple of years, but this is certainly based off of what we can tell um, at the moment. So what, what is being proposed? So it's certainly um, it affects pretty much everyone um, that's currently subject to corporation tax. So all companies that are currently subject to corporation tax, apart from the 2,000 or so largest businesses, and they're the largest businesses that are covered in the very large quick scheme. Um, so companies that um, make more than 20 million pounds of profit per year. Uh, the reason that they tend to, uh, that they've been generally excluded from this is that they're already doing quarterly submissions and quarterly payments. Um, and therefore, the kind of the, the idea from HMRC is that they kind of already know um, a lot more information about those businesses than um, than the ones that they're, they're kind of doing an annual filing. So that's why they're proposing that they're um, exempt from uh, the MTD for corporation tax, at least for, for now. Um, the timeline is a long one. Um, so voluntary from April 2024 and then mandatory, they say mandatory no earlier than April 2026. So again, we've got we've got a good five year run into this, um, five or six year run into this. So it's um, it's, it is a long way off, which is you know, good news for many. Um, and then the details, and you know, I'm not going to go into all the details today. I could quite have happily spent an hour talking around just this um, topic if uh, if I wanted to. But it, you know, digital records and digital links are both in scope of, of what we um, are looking at here. So a lot of kind of the thought processes that people have kind of had to go through for MPD for VAT um, will be applying in this space. Um, the key kind of changes is that on a quarterly basis, um, you'll be required to report accounting data. So there are 28 categories they list out, and they're quite high-level categories, um, you know, things that you would expect to see in a p and um, But it's kind of, it's mostly accounting data with a kind of a tax slant on it. But effectively, it's a quarterly reporting requirement, and that is a material change from uh, what, where we are now. You know, that's a lot more reporting. Um, and I'll show you just in, in the next slide what that kind of looks like in a, in a timeline. Um, and that's a submission one month after the quarter end. Of that data and then the the annual process stays the same so the annual kind of full corporation tax return stays the same um, there will need to be a kind of a true up between the quarterly positions and the annual position um, but also one of the things that they've asked um, is that um, you know do they do you think it's feasible that you that they would reduce the timetable for a corporation tax return from 12 months to nine months and that would be in alignment with the stat accounts so um, that's an interesting piece because a lot of people will use the stat accounts to kind of inform or as the kind of source data 
for the corporation tax return. And of course, if you're required to submit both of them at the same time, then you might not be able to do that, or you might have to accelerate your stats timetable. So this is one of the areas where it felt like HMRC were more asking the question rather than kind of saying, look, we're going to reduce it from 12 months to nine months. And um, it was more, you know, asking the question of, you know, what would be the impact on your business if you had to reduce that timetable from uh, from 12 to nine? Because I think that's a, a key area where they're looking for feedback from the industry. Um, it's certainly one of the areas that we'll be looking to feedback on um, when we kind of produce our, um, as a business, our kind of response to the consultation. Um, so, you know, the, the quarterly submission piece is the, is the main change, I think, to a, to a lot of people. But there are kind of lots of other nuances in there that I won't get into. But looking at a typical timetable, if you look at the top half there, the kind of if you're, a, you know, this, this is what applies to most businesses. There are different nuances and people can have long accounting periods and um, some people are, you know, in that very large PIP scheme and therefore this wouldn't be the case or some listed businesses are slightly different to unlisted businesses. But for the majority of people, if you've got a December year and you go through the accounting period and, and from a corporation tax point of view, you're not doing any reporting on that um, data until, you know, the following September for the stats and the actual return um, right at the end. So the following December, you've got the 12 months, you've got the 12 months um, to the following year. So that's kind of a two year time span. Because what they're suggesting under MTD for corporation tax is that, you know, you, you do your January to March of year one. And by the end of April, you've reported, again, it's quite high level stuff. It's only 28 figures, um, but you're, you're giving them that data kind of Q1, Q2. So you've got those filings throughout the year. Um, and that kind of carries on on a quarterly basis. And then you do your stats and your kind of full return the following September. So it is a, a material change, I think. And that's why, you know, that it feels like that's one of the reasons that they're giving businesses such a long time to consider this is that it is a big um a big change and if you look at kind of for example here i think one of the one of the drivers that was behind and they actually reference it in the consultation is that um they feel like they're not getting timely data about businesses in this in this tranche so the, the businesses that fall into scope of this um and that you know they use the example kind of, you know, if you're making a profit in January of year one, at the moment, you're not reporting that data at all to them until December of the following year. So it's a 24-month kind of time lag or 23-month time lag in that instance, whereas what they're proposing is something, you know, getting that data in April of the first year. So that's a 20-month difference, or indeed, if it was a profit made in January, a 22-month difference. So that is a, a massive increase um, in how quickly HMRC get that data. So I think um, you know, to, to, to sum up on what we're kind of seeing, what does it mean? So they're getting the data much sooner than at present, um, which is an interesting, interesting thing. That's what they're kind of driving at. And that's something that, um, you know, is, it, if you read the consultation top to bottom, that is a general theme that kind of comes through. They want that information sooner. Um, there is the potential, potential if, they, if they bring those two filing dates, if they bring the nine months together, then there has to be a much closer coupling of stats and DT returns because you wouldn't have the time um, necessarily to kind of do your stats and then have another three months to do the CT return. So that's a, a kind of thing. And of course, do remember, as I said at the start, that this is a consultation. Um, but, you know, that's what it would mean if it was implemented in its current state. It does mean that there's an increase in workload. There's, um, you know, there's, there's those spikes to get that data out, those spikes that don't currently exist. Um, so a big change in that. Um, and then, you know, digital records and digital links. I think, um, Digital records, again, you know, it, it is a, it's something to, to consider, but in the fullness of time, we should be able to get there. But digital links for corporation tax is a different um, beast as well, because we do see in corporation tax processes today, we do see a lot of manual intervention. So how would that play out? That's another big thing. Um, and then the other thing they do reference as well, and I've not really talked about it so far, but it's around the IXBRL submission. I think there's a general viewpoint from HMRC that the IXBRL data is not good quality. Um, and that they would expect this to drive a much, because they're kind of more tightly coupling the stats and the CT returns, is that that kind of data will get much better um, in terms of the quality and therefore be a lot more useful uh, to HMRC. So, you know, what, what I didn't want to do is come here and kind of scaremonger. Um, there is a lot of time. There is a lot of, um, you know, it is a consultation. But, you know, having read through the document and having done some analysis, um, it's important to, to know. And I can see loads of questions flying in on the Q&A. So looking forward to picking some of these up. Um, at the end. Um, but in terms of the next poll question then, um, based on what you now know, so based on what I've kind of talked about for the last five or ten minutes, uh, what do you think? Um, do you think it's impossible? There's no way we could do this at all, even if it was five years from now. Um, is this something that's going to be tough? Um, and we hope that the requirements get watered down. Um, do we think it's okay? Yeah, we need to do some work, but we've, we've got time. Uh, it's easy, um, and we need a few tweaks, or it's kind of, you know, it's already done. It's, it's not a problem for us if you could uh, submit your answers now. 
once again, thanks very much, Russell. We've got a, some more of a presentation still to come after this second and final poll question um, before we hit the questions. As Russell just said, we have seen quite a lot of your uh, questions coming in already. So thank you very much for sending those in. We will get to as many of them as we can. Um, but if you are in the audience, and you have any other questions, please do um, use the Q&A widget to send them in. That's the question mark. Uh, the other thing just I wanted to reiterate, which is that if you are uh, looking for any additional resources, a copy of the slides, or you want to read more about the sort of things that we're talking about, um, or if you want to check out the uh, digitalization of tax paper that I mentioned uh, earlier, then th those are all available from the resources section. Um, with the second poll now being closed, I'll hand you back to Russell. Cool. So that's... Uh... That's a good, good kind of peak of answers I guess in the middle. Um, it's good to see that there are, you know, there's probably only a couple of respondents saying, you know, this is impossible, um, and, and most people thinking, you know, it's, it's tough, um, and we, we hope they get kind of watered down, or, or it's okay being the main answer, um, and we've got time to get there. So it's encouraging to see that it's not kind of seen as uh, all doom and gloom. Um, only you know, six percent of people thinking it's kind of easy um, to, to do that. So I think. Um, it's good to see that as a, a good spread of answers, and I think I would, I'd probably be in the same camp. You know, it's it's what they're proposing is is a shift. It's a it's a step change for sure. Um, it's it's reflected, I think, in the timetable that they're providing. But um, you know, you, on, on the one hand, you can say, well, it's a big change. On the other hand, you can say, well, you know, the, the kind of the reporting process does need a bit of reform. And they, you know, the fact that if you make a profit in a January, you're not reporting it, you know, until the you know tw nearly two years later. Um, I can I can understand the push from HMRC to want to see that sooner. So. Um, yeah, I think that's a good good spread of answers. That's kind of in line with what I'd expect, which is great. Um, so moving on then to technology, um, just I've got a few slides on kind of what what are we seeing? So, you know, I spend my life looking at tax technology and working out uh, what we should build and why we should build it and who we should build it for and what does that kind of architecture look like? And, and, and part of that as well is talking to businesses or so talking to um, accountancy firms and talking to advisors, talking to, to corporate clients as well on what they're kind of doing and what does their tax technology architecture. And what I've tried to do is distill this down into a few uh, kind of key themes. Um, and I've absolutely stolen this analogy from one of our firms, um, one of the firms that we work with. Um, but the way that they talk about it is the kind of, they call it about a, kind of a burger, a burger with two buns and an interior. And what, and what I mean by that is you've got the different sections. So you've got these two buns that are quite kind of generic, um, but the, the, the kind of the, the first bun getting data in. So it's all around the data. How do we get the data into a product? And, getting that out of a source system and transforming it and loading it from a source system and putting it into a kind of a common data pool. That's kind of generic technology. That's not specific to tax. Um, and the same on the bottom bun, um, you know, the insights, being able to use the data that you're kind of processing and then be able to report on that to provide kind of business intelligence, business feedback. Again, that's, that's um, technology that isn't specific to tax. You know, it can be used in a tax way. So this is why they're kind of describing it as a burger because they're saying, well, it doesn't matter whether it's tax or it's finance. It doesn't matter if it's UK tax or Irish tax or French tax or any of the country's tax. So how you get data in and how you transform it and how you kind of view it, it's generic kind of functionality. So they're seeing kind of that as the top and the bottom. And then they're using the middle bit as the kind of what they would call kind of operations and applications. So where you see operations in terms of management of the function, um, tax risk, where you've got specific things like SAO, uh, BRR and things like that. And then tax application, so the actual calculation of the returns, obviously that's very UK specific, be it a, you know, a UK VAT return, a UK corporation tax return. So what they're seeing is this kind of, you know, we, we need to process the data to get it in, we need to view the data to do stuff with it, um, and that's generic across the piece. And in fact, people can borrow, you know, bits of kit from finance or other areas of the business for that. But then they're looking at those kind of operations and applications as, uh, you know, specific to them and something that they need to do. Um, so that's kind of the overall architecture, and just jumping into um, each individual in, each individual bit to talk, talk you through a little bit more. Uh, tax data, we're seeing this is becoming more and more prevalent, where people are kind of looking for a single source of truth. And if you look at the kind of HMRC requirements, you can see why people are more looking to kind of extract that data once. You know, if we look to MTD for corporation tax, we're going to be pulling more data more often. We're going to need to submit it more often. Um, and therefore, the kind of advantages from automation, um, you know, get, get kind of magnified so we can pull the data out more, be it, you know, using Excel or APIs, be it from more kind of legacy systems like SAP and Oracle or more kind of, you know, cloud-based first systems like Xero, um, extracting that and then transforming it for use in the process. And we're seeing these kind of technologies um, exist more and more and more. Um, 
throughout tax functions. So that's a key part. And I think a lot of people, you know, some businesses have already completed this journey. They've kind of got this bit down. They know what they're doing. Others are kind of on this journey now. Um, but we are seeing it become more and more prevalent across the industry as to how people are kind of doing doing that. Um, management of the data-driven tax function, we're, we're seeing this We're seeing this more and more. And it, it's always been around. But when you look at things like SAO and tax risk, people have kind of tended to, you know, do it in Word documents and shove it in a SharePoint folder and kind of forget about it until they need to do it. But again, We've seen this driven more, we've seen it driven a lot more by remote working. So, for example, approvals. Now, you know, we wind back 12 months. A lot of people, a lot of businesses were still doing signatures, you know, in ink on paper, um, which is something that, you know, you're still allowed to do, but it's, much, it's become much harder because of, because of COVID and having to remote work. So we've seen people adopting DocuSign and Adobe Sign and other things like that to do approval or a specific approval portal. So, again, we're seeing people driving um, around kind of tax operations a lot more. Um, to kind of make sure that their processes are watertight. It's not just about the numbers, but it's about the, the kind of data that goes around those numbers, the information that goes with it. Um, and then, you know, I've, I've kind of made the point already, but a, a lot of people have got um, something in place and had to for the EAT and for CT and for other taxes that um, has, has required them to kind of get information out to HMRC in a specific format. So they're used to technology in that space um, for that kind of calculation space. But also what I think we're seeing is... Um, people then wanting to get insight into that data. So saying, well, you know, if, if you look at the data that's in a corporation tax return, um, as an example, that information is actually quite rich in information because, you know, it's got it, it's kind of post-processing, if you like. It's the only place that you could go to see certain pieces of information, like, a, you know, how much we're, we're going to claim on an R&D tax credit is a great example where that's going to probably only exist in that kind of corporation tax process because that's where it's kind of calculated and used. So. We're seeing more and more people wanting to put reporting around that and to kind of elevate that data. Um, and, you know, something that one of the reasons that that has become um, more common is that the technology in this space um, has become much more readily available. So things like uh, ClickView and Tableau and Microsoft Power BI, all great examples where if you, if you wind the clock back three or four years, they were quite hard to use. They were quite expensive and they were quite hard to um you know, to roll out within businesses. This is becoming a lot more commonplace, particularly with adoption of cloud technology, um, but also, you know, if you look at the, the, the pricing around something like a Microsoft Power BI, it's, it's very, very affordable now. So that's why people are able to do this much more readily and um, it's much more understood. So those are the kind of key themes that we're seeing across technology. Uh, what does that kind of look like? We're, we're seeing a drive towards a kind of a, a, a tax platform, if you like. So having something that can deal with the kind of data cleansing aspect and the management of the data, getting insights from that. But then, you know, I think a key um, a key theme that we're tending to find more and more is that, you know, we want to pull the information out from our ERP system once. So we want to have that information pulled out automatically. Um, and we don't then want to have to farm it off to CT and separately to STAT and separately to VAT and separately to country by country and everything. We, that needs to all be kind of linked up. So this kind of idea of having one kind of data solution for, for tax is really becoming quite prevalent in the industry, which is good to see. Um, so that's kind of a bit of an architectural overview of what I'm seeing the market moving towards. Um, and then just a kind of a bit of a prediction. I think this is one of the, the areas that we've been spending quite a bit of time on is that when you look at things like, and it's kind of, you know, you can play a little bit of buzzword bingo on this slide, but you've got kind of, you know, AI and machine learning. It, it certainly, we're still very much in early adopted technology territory here. We're not in a situation where the majority of tax functions um, have any kind of AI and machine learning. And there are still not... Um, you know, really applications of this that are being used by the mass market. If, but if you look at kind of a standard technology adoption curve like this is, it feels to me like, you know, over the next year or two, we aren't too far from a from a real ramp up in this space. And that's, again, because of the fact that, you know, it's becoming more commonplace. These technologies are becoming more um, commonplace across, you know, finance and, and other areas of, of business, but also that the understanding of the technology and the cost of the technology. Again, you know, I made the point previously, but if you, if you look to AI technology, three or four years ago, you were talking, you know, six figures comfortably to build something in, whereas now the cost is coming down, the understanding's going up, and the use cases are going up. So it's a really exciting time. I think, you know, if I was doing this um, webinar in four or five years' time, I would thoroughly expect most tax functions to have some form of uh, some form of AI in there, which is quite an exciting thing um, to kind of crystal ball gaze into. Uh, the other area that we spend um, a bit of time on and people kind of ask quite a lot around is around RPA, so which is robotic process automation, which is, um, you know, the ability to automate um, tasks using, um, and there are loads and loads of RPA tools out there, and they're all really, really good. 
Um, you know, my, my take on it is that RPA absolutely can cut time, massive amounts of time out of, a, out of a system, out of a process. So you can take processes that take days and cut them down to minutes and hours. Um, so RPA as a standalone tool can be great, but maybe as a, a bit of a mini disc player. And by that, I mean, um, and this was a quote I got from one of our clients when we were discussing RPA, and they kind of, they kind of you know, hit the nail on the head for me. And they said, well, it's great, but it allows my team to make the same mistakes as they did at Excel, but only quicker on a much greater scale. So effectively, it's replacing um, Excel and automating it. So, you know, you're going to hit the things like the digital link requirements, but you're not necessarily solving the problem. So if you've got a, if you've got kind of that kind of garbage in, garbage out, if the data itself is not good enough, then RPA won't fix that. It will just make um, it will just make it quicker to get those um, mistakes through the process. So, um, but, you know, at the same time, we're still seeing an adoption of RPA quite heavily. Um, uh, a lot of people are kind of building bits of RPA's little box into processes to, to remove manual tasks. So that's um, something we are seeing um, a lot more now. So it's, it's, it's an interesting one there. So that's just, again, a bit of crystal ball gazing. Um, and moving on, because I, I do want to leave a few minutes at the end for, for some questions here. Um, practical steps. How do we kind of go about taking some of this theory and getting it into practice? Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a, a first slide here on what are we hearing? So what is the market telling us from kind of when people are asking us to, to pitch for, for technology um, and when they're talking to their advisors around what they want from their kind of request for proposals, what are we seeing? I mean, number one absolutely is VAT automation. I mean, the, the VAT automation space um, for the last quarter and going into the first half of next year is going to be the key area that, that most businesses are going to be focusing on. If they've not fixed that already, um, for the half of the businesses that haven't kind of done that yet um, from our poll, that certainly is going to be the key focus um, in the technology space for the first half of next year as people kind of make sure they're compliant and get those processes in place, either, you know, getting a kind of full solution in place and they're kind of happy with where they are, um, or indeed um, if they are kind of, you know, you know, doing some heavy lifting in Excel to kind of do something for now to get it over the line and then maybe solving the problem more fully after that. We are seeing um, an increase of process kind of quick fixes around RPA. So a lot of them, you know, looking um, to, to, to do that. Maybe they've got a particular part of the process that for whatever reason takes, you know, two or three weeks of manual effort currently, um, looking to some of the newer tools in the market to, um, to be able to kind of take those processes and streamline them and kind of get them, get them fixed. Uh, we have already seen in a couple of RFPs that have come out in the last couple of weeks, um, people mentioning, and in fact, um, even before the consultation came around, people wanting to know, you know, what are the right approaches? What kind of things are, you know, what kind of prep work can we do now, um, you know, to, to do this? So I'm, I'm quite surprised at this one, to be honest, but we are already seeing that feed through. Um, and then the last one really is, and this is, you know, a, a couple of the kind of, I guess, the slightly, you know, the bigger advisors have been talking around API driven. So how can we get um, tax systems to talk to other systems? And I don't mean tax systems, the organization I work for, I mean just our tax system. Um, how do we get that to interact with other systems being it pushing and pulling data from finance or pushing and putting data from reporting functions or um, pushing and putting data, you know, into into any other system? So we are seeing that kind of requirement because I think, uh, uh, you know, tax technology more broadly has been maybe left behind compared to other parts of the finance function. And therefore, we are seeing people wanting to say, well, you know, we want a material shift forward and APIs are a big way that we can do that. Um, and then just finally, this one is a, is a recap of the Kind of the the plan of attack so if, if if i'm an in-house tax person what's the uh what's the kind of process i'm going to go through to try and get um you know get, get kind of funding and get a, a, a tax technology kind of strategy in place so the first one really is that um you know critically assess where are you weakest and and kind of where where are the kind of those sticky plasters where you know it was a quick fix here and a quick fix there and i think you know most people and I, I speak to are you know pretty open and honest and say well we're really good in this area but actually this but over here we just kind of we didn't have time or we were really busy doing something else or whatever it might be um and you know there are lots and lots of good reasons why um people people have the, the processes and systems in place that they do but kind of just being critical and just saying look this is these are the two or three areas where we know we're weakest and um you know where we think we can do better um, and, and then from that you know forming a strategy and i think one of the key things always to do when you're doing this is to get it get a kind of a senior stakeholder in the process early and get them to understand that it's not just you know we don't just want to go and buy some technology because it's pretty and make some nice graphs or something like that it's that you know there has to be a key kind of return on investment and one of the things we often get asked in the sales team in our business often get asked is, look you know if you're going to ask me to spend some money what's the what's the return on investment how can i show to the business that we're going to get payback from this and i think that's always something to to build in early um, in the process to say look you know we think we can cut out this much of the process or we can reduce this amount of mistakes or 
Um, you know, we've seen others that say, you know, if we bring in other technology, we will, might be able to recover additional tax because we can get more information. You know, there can be a real kind of cash benefit to some of this stuff as well. So it's not just about um, some of the software stuff. So I think that's important to kind of get that buy-in. Um, assess the market. Um, tax technology has massively moved on in the last couple of years. So uh, get out there and go and talk to people. Um, there's a lot of great technology um, in the market now that didn't exist a couple of years ago. So go and have a look at what's out there. And, and then pick the vendors. And I think... Um, you know, the, the best vendors will kind of what I call their kind of play nicely together. They'll kind of they'll, they will work together. So it shouldn't be a case of having to pick, you know, one vendor and go all in with them. It's a case of picking the best bits and kind of making sure that they integrate and play nicely with each other. Um, and the last bit really then, you know, actually putting it into practice, you know, once once you've got it in in there, make sure that you're using the um, that using the technology. I've, I've, you know, in my time, I've absolutely seen instances where people have spent you know, six months, nine months, bringing in some technology and then kind of get set it up and that gets really, you know, well used for the first six months and then people just kind of forget about it or um, they don't use it as much as they should. So, you know, make sure that you're able to drive that kind of real key business insight um, because a lot of the technology out there can do that um, in a really good way. So that's kind of it from me. Um, I appreciate this. I talk quite quickly and I kind of can ramble on. I, I you know, I, I could, as I said earlier, I could talk on pretty much any of these topics for hours and hours. It's it's, it's the role that I do. Um, so I get quite excited about it. So uh, apologies if I've sounded too overzealous in any of the areas, but um, certainly hopefully uh, a useful summary of kind of what I think, where we're going, um, some useful bits on that and on MCD for CT. Um, I can't imagine too many people on the call have uh, read through the, the full consultation as, as I have and many other people in the business have um, attack systems. So... Um, yeah, I'm going to open it up to questions. Great. Just uh, thank us again, Russell, for all your time and uh, and uh, for putting this together. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we do have quite a few questions, so I'm going to get straight into it. Uh, the first one I've got here is from James, and James asks, um, all this talk about the MTD for corporation tax, do we have any idea if this or how this will affect charitable organisations? Yeah, so it, they, they are um, called out specifically. There is a question around um, charitable organisations and um, dormant companies as well. Um, at the moment, I believe that the consultation um, so says that they will be um, in, in scope in the same way that charities are in scope of MTD for the AT, but they have specifically put a question in the consultation um, around that. So I would uh, encourage charitable organisations to you know take a look and um, and obviously, therefore, kind of respond and, and um, make your make your views known as to um, why you should or shouldn't be involved. But that it, it is at least called out separately, which is good news. Great. And question here from Elizabeth. Uh, so you're talking, obviously, with all of this about reporting and moving up the kind of reporting cycle. Um, but what about payments? Yeah, it's a great one because um, I was expecting there to, to be a lot more in the consultation on it. They, it's pretty light touch what they've talked about uh, in payments um, in there in the, in the sense of I don't. Um, as far as I'm aware, and I, I could be I could be wrong in saying this, but as far as I'm aware, they haven't proposed any any changes to that. Now, I, I would suspect that once they make their mind up on things like, you know, if it will, you know, if they're definitely going with quarterly reporting or if they are going for nine months rather than 12 months, the kind of payment schedule will then follow um, or at least fall out the back of it, because I suppose you can't define one without the other. Um, but certainly it, it felt to me a little bit light on that front. Um, there were there, there were. A few areas in the consultation that we will be feeding back that we felt um, were, were not maybe um, reflected. So we have one of the other areas that wasn't really covered as well. Now I'm going off on a tangent, but it's interesting is that um, you know loss-making companies. They're talking about large companies that make profits over 20 million. What about the likes of a big telecoms company that makes losses because they have um, giant R&D expenditure and intangibles and things of that nature? So there are a few areas that were missed. I think payments are in that category of something that they probably haven't mentioned as much as they could have done um, and therefore we would expect more um, as we go through that. Very good. Um, um, just one thing actually what I remember um, is that um, in January they are running a series of uh, kind of workshops um, for different industry groups. Um, so you know there's one for software vendors, there's one for um, different groups. I think I'm not sure if there is one for charities but there are five or six different industry groups that they have pulled out. Um, and it's on their website, so if you just Google um, MTD for Corporation Tax and go and find the HMRC link, you can see the dates and you can actually register for those. Um, they're 90-minute sessions, so I would encourage um, anyone to get involved in those if they've got specific questions or want to get into HMRCs. Um, we'll certainly be there on the, the software vendors one. Well. Sorry, Karen. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to press on and we'll get to as many questions as we can. If we don't get time for all the questions, don't worry, we'll do our best to follow up after the webinar. Uh, I've got another question here from Alexander. So Alex wants to know, 
if we download a digital file in its entirety from the accounting software into Excel, perform some calculations in Excel, does that meet the digital link requirement? Is that, uh, is that sufficient? Um, generally, yes, as long as you're not doing any kind of copy pasting or transposition. So for example, if, you, if you're downloading the file and then you've got an, another you know, workbook or another sheet that kind of automatically links and does some sums of the you know, equal sum of column E, that's absolutely fine, but what you can't do is take the data and copy paste it into another sheet to kind of then sum that up, if that makes sense. So generally speaking, an Excel process can be uh, absolutely fine. It's just, I think it's the copy paste and the manual keying are the two main areas where you really want to avoid doing them. Um, so sure. it, again, it's, it's a bit of a gray area, but certainly, um, you know, Excel is an is a entirely appropriate tool if used in the right way. Uh, on that note, I should mention that I'm the editor of ICW's Excel community. So if you're interested in learning more about using Excel efficiently and effectively, a uh, quick plug worth checking out ICAW Excel community, uh, icaw.com slash join Excel. Uh, let's take some more questions. I've got one here from James. So asking about MTD for corporation tax again, what do we think is uh, HMRC's cost benefit analysis, particularly considering that the cost is mostly on the company side and the benefit is entirely on the HMRC, hmm. uh, HMRC side. Yes, in the, well, indeed. Indeed. Um, yeah, no, no I, I, would, I would agree. Um, I mean, we, we've certainly seen from a, from a benefit point of view, um, again, to, to HMRC, we know that they publish their tax gap figures every year. And if memory serves, I believe um, corporation tax um, specifically attributes something like 2.1 billion of tax gap. Um, and therefore, that would be what they would point to as the benefit of, you know, what they're kind of going after with this, because, of course, the reason that MTD is being put in place by and large for, for VAT and for, tax, and for the rest of the taxes is to kind of reduce that tax gap. So that's what they'll point at. The consultation is pretty light on the cost benefit. Um, they kind of, you know, suggest that this shouldn't really cost firms much to implement. They do ask um, some questions in the consultation around, um, you know, costings for this. So, again, if you're looking at this consultation going, well, this is just going to cost me, you know, tens of thousands of pounds to comply with. Uh, that will certainly be a, a good piece of feedback for HMRC to get. So I'd encourage people to feed that back. So they do ask about it, but they certainly haven't provided any uh, detailed breakdowns at this point in terms of what they think um, it's going to cost. They did just kind of say, oh, we don't think it should be very much because people are already using software already anyway. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Very good. And, and equally, if, if you, I think for anyone in the audience, if that's not your impression, then this is exactly what the when these consultations are good times to be bringing that up to HMRC because, you know, their studies say that it'll be you know a few quid upfront and a few more quid a year or what have you. Then you know it's it's helpful to provide additional information if that's not the case. Um, let's try and get to at least one more question. Um, we had one actually on taxes already uh, for. So we've been going on charities already. There was another question here from Alan. Um, is there anything in the consultation mentioning about regular partnerships? So not limited liability partnerships, but just uh, the more traditional kind. Uh, not anything specifically off the top of my head that I can remember. Again, they, they try and kind of keep it relatively high level and kind of say, thing, you know, for example, if you're currently subject to corporation tax, then this will apply to you unless you're a very large quits player. So, um, again, it's, it's worth reading because there are a couple of pages um, specifically that will cover exactly the organisations that are that they deem to be in and out of scope. Um, but I don't um, recall them asking, you know, having detailed information on, on partnerships. So again, worth having a look. And again, if it's if it's not called out explicitly, then it's worth um, feeding that back and saying, you know, can you make sure that this is included because um, we do expect them to, you know, that they will have missed things in the consultation for sure. Great. I think we've got time for one last question. So I'm going to combine two here from Elizabeth, who asks, if you're in a retail environment and you sell one or two items a day, like in an antique shop, can you just input that sales information at the end of the day or week or month to your accounts package? Can you still raise a sales invoice in Word and then input the details to an accounting package manually from there? Um, what's the kind of situation for those those kinds of uh, of businesses? Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, so that's where uh, it's, it's allowed. For example, you know, if, you, if you're using a, a QuickBooks or a Xero or a Sage or, or something like that, you know, there are many, many solutions in that part of the market. Um, and yeah, that's where your kind of digital record starts. So once you kind of make a sale, you can put it into those systems uh, manually as you are now. It's then just making sure that those records are, you know, you're, they're then linked from that point onwards. So you wouldn't then be allowed to, you know, take that information and copy paste it into another Excel working book, for example. But you know, how you record those transactions. 
um, that doesn't necessarily need to change for, for MTD. It's, um, that would be your digital record, which is your kind of start point uh, of your kind of digital journey. So that's kind of the, the start point rather than the, the actual kind of, you know, Word document, if you like. Great. Well, um, we've uh, reached the end of our time. So apologies to those of you whose questions we didn't get time to address. We will try and follow up with those after the webinar, but we did get through most of them. Thank you all very much for being so uh, involved and in enthusiastic, engaging in the question section there. And I just want to say thanks once again to Russell for your time uh, to speak to uh, these topics and for your insight and advice. I very much appreciate it. And thank you all to, the, to our listeners and questions sending on for sending in. And I hope you found the session useful. Um, when we close the webinar in just a moment's time, then a short feedback survey will pop up on your screen after the webinar is finished that you can use to let us know how, what you thought of this webinar and what you'd like to see from ICAW in terms of events in the future. Uh, the webinar has also been recorded and we will be sending out links to the on-demand recording uh, to you, hopefully later on this afternoon or if not, then shortly afterwards. So thank you very much indeed uh, for attending and hope you have a very good afternoon. And thanks once again to Russell for presenting this afternoon for us. Thank you.